If you've ever been looking at somebody else's source code in Haskell and you've noticed a tilde sitting in an instance declaration, you may have wondered, what is that? It's called an inequality constraint. And you may also be wondering, why would you ever use one and should you be using them in your code? Today, we're going to hit at least at a very high level what those are and why you would want to use them. This, by the way, is based off of a blog post by Chris Dunn, link below. The purpose of equality constraints, the primary purpose at least, is all about type inference. You want to use equality constraints in order to help the type inferencer so that the compiler is able to figure out what type you want to be dealing with instead of requiring the user of your library or the user of your type class to have to figure it out for you. Uh, it is possible to completely bypass them in, I believe, every case. There may be some exceptions to that. However, if you do that, type inference is going to suffer. And if you go ahead and you include these, you are documenting to a certain extent what the intended usage is of this instance. So let's go ahead and start off with some examples. These are going to be very string heavy because strings are a very nice, easy way to demonstrate this, but it does in fact apply to other cases besides strings. We're going to come up with this two string type class. This type class is going to let us convert anything into a string. And the anything here may be something like a text from the text package, maybe a byte string, can be lots of different things. But for the moment, all we care about is what's in the base package, and we're going to look at strings themselves. Let's go ahead and jump over to our code. And as you can see, we've gone ahead and provided a two string implementation for the string type. Now you can remember a string is actually just a type synonym for char. Let's go ahead and see what happens if we try to run this, which is in fact not going to work right off the bat. Sure enough, illegal instance declaration because we don't have types in an instances turned on. We could do that. We could come up here and you can watch me very slowly and incorrectly type in type synonym instances and we'll get past that error message. And I'll just prove that to you. We get on to the next error message instead. Another possibility, if you are so inclined, is to just go ahead and expand that type synonym directly. Either way, things work, and then you could turn off the type synonym instances. In any event, we come up to our next error message. The next one is saying that we need flexible instances, which is a little bit interesting that we're being told we need flexible instances in this case. Uh, the reason we need flexible instances is because out of the box, Haskell 98 kind of code, Type class instances are expected to follow a very specific pattern with a concrete type constructor and then type variables. We don't have that here. Instead, we have a type constructor, which is the list uh, type constructor, but we then have a concrete type sitting underneath it. So one possibility here would in fact be to just turn on flexible instances. And then we go ahead and we write that and everything is fine. But maybe perhaps there's some kind of a Haskell 98 of the solution to this kind of a problem. And keep in mind, we're not hitting equality constraints yet. This is still just the buildup. So let's see if we can get rid of the flexible instances entirely. And the answer is we can do that. We can do that by using a separate type class. So right here, we're saying that two string is going to work by converting a char, a list of chars. Maybe we're going to say instead, I don't know what this is going to be. This is going to be some A. Well, this is going to fail, of course, because you can't just convert a list of some things into a list of strings. But we could come up with this other helper type class, to char. We could say that in order to do this, we have a method to char takes an A and gives you back a char. All right, let's go ahead and look at the error message we get out of this. The error message is now saying couldn't match A with char, and there's no instance of two char for char. So these are two different messages. Let's hit the first one first. We're still using ID up here. Really what we want to do is we want to convert each element of this list into a character. And we do that using map to char. Cool, everything works. We're still left with the second error message. No instance of two char for char, which isn't terribly surprising. You can't go ahead and convert and use this instance without providing uh, use this class without providing an instance. So I'm going to do this. Say converting a char into a char is just ID. Finally, we have our working silly little program, and we're able to print out Hello World. Okay, very good, very nice. Haskell 98 solution to the problem. 
everything seems okay. Well, let's take it a little bit further. As a result of the fact that we now have this separate type class that we're playing around with, this two-char type class, turns out you can provide multiple instances of two-char. Let's go ahead and copy-paste this code over. And we keep the same two-char instance that we had before, but we have also introduced this additional instance for int. And this is going to rely on the enum type class, which in practice you should not be doing this kind of thing. Uh, this is going to run into all kinds of weirdness around Unicode, but don't worry about that for the moment. Let's just go ahead and see how this works out in practice. So now we've said, not only can you convert a char into a char, you can convert an int into a char. And therefore, you can also convert a list of ints into a string. And here we go. I have provided a list of ints. I'm passing it into two string. And if you're wondering, these are the ASCII code points for hello. So it should print out the word hello. But let's see what happens in practice. We now have an error message about an ambiguous type variable. It says that there's a literal 72, prevents the constraint num of a. Well, it turns out that there's something kind of weird about numeric literals in Haskell. All numeric literals get expressed in terms of some type class using the from integer method. So in fact, we don't know that this is going to be an int. Maybe it's going to be an int 8. Maybe it's going to be a word. Maybe it's going to be a word 32 or something else. We don't have those instances. Even if we have those instances, we wouldn't be able to select which one to use. So instead, in order to solve this problem, I just need to say, yeah, this is a list of ints. And if I come back over here, and I run this, now everything works. So that worked, but it's not particularly pleasing. It's, we don't like the fact that we had to explicitly type in what the type is. We don't like these annotations. We would like the inferencer to kick in a little bit more. Now we finally, at the end of all of this, we get to see our first example of an equality constraint. What we want to be able to say is, hey, you know when we were converting into a character, that to char? I, I'm telling you, I know for a fact that the input to that is going to be an int. And you can't do that with Haskell 98. You can't you do that with the tricks we've seen up until now. Instead, oh, and one other thing, you can't have multiple instances anymore. The whole point of this is to be able to say, I know the only thing I can convert into a character using the two char type class is an int. So right off the bat, we've got to say goodbye to our two char instance for char. And now we're going to change the way that we express this. The way that we've written this instance says, Int is one implementation of two char. Instead, we're going to use a different trick. And we're going to say, you know what? There is only one instance, and it's based off of this type variable. And by the way, that type variable, I'm telling you, is an int. This is what's called an equality constraint. We are saying this type variable A must be equal to int. And the reason this works the way that we're describing it is because when instance resolution kicks in with Haskell, it looks at what's called the instance head before it looks at the constraints. So the constraints are only applied after the fact. There is exactly one instance possible that looks like this, because you can't throw in, you know, without using overlapping instances or other more advanced techniques. Without that in place, we only have one possible instance, and then we constrain that instance to say, and it must be an int. Let's go ahead and take off that type annotation and let's see what error messages we get next. So now we get an error message about flexible instances again. That's not terribly surprising, because it doesn't fit the, ma the model of what a Haskell 98 instance is supposed to look like. All right, I'll put that in. And now it says you can't use an equality constraint. No surprise there. There are two language extensions that you can turn on in order to get equality constraints, either gadgets or type families. And I'm going to choose gadgets here for the very important reason that it is shorter to type. Go ahead and run that. Hello. Boom. We now have type inference. We have lost something along the way, of course. We can no longer come back down here and convert a string back into a string. This will fail because it couldn't match type char with int. You can only convert a list of ints. You cannot convert a list of chars. All right. Let's go ahead and jump back over to our slides and have a quick recap of what we've seen so far, and then we're going to see one more example. 
instances of the form, instance foo a, or instance bar of a list of chars. Both need flexible instances because they do not fit the formula of a Haskell 98 instance of a concrete type constructor followed by a bunch of type variables. Instances of the form instance foo some type allow an additional instance to be available, instance foo some other type. And therefore, the compiler can't figure out which of those instances you're trying to play with. And finally, this kind of instance where you say, I have a type variable, it's A, this is going to capture every possible instance you could define. And then after the instance head is satisfied like this, I am going to go ahead and constrain it using an equality constraint to say, and by the way, A must be some type, and I can rely on that through the, the implementation of that type class. All right. By the way, one final little point on this first example. There is a slightly nicer way to write this. Now that we've gotten to the point that there is this dummy implementation of two char that has exactly one uh, use case, you can actually get rid of it entirely. And you can come back up here and you can say, yeah, you know what? We don't need to say two char on C. We can just say that C is an int and we can directly call two enum. We can call from enum. I always get them backwards. Oh, right. And we'd have to actually, let's just put in something else. And I had it right the first time. OK, cool. So we're good. So that's one example. Let's see another example. Once we see the second example, then we're going to generalize the rule that we're looking at, and we'll be done. All right. This one is more real life. ToString is not a type class that really exists or is not, at least not used very often. But there is the alternative, the reverse of it, which is part of the language pragma overloaded strings. Overloaded strings essentially replaces every string literal in your code, like foo, with from string foo. And from string comes from the type class is string. This is used in many places to let you automatically convert a string literal into a text, into a byte string, HTML if you're dealing with something like Blaze HTML or Lucid, and of course, converting a string into itself, or not converting it at all. This is a great language extension to use because it encourages you to do the right thing and not use a string all over the place because, as we'll cover elsewhere, strings are not a great data type to be using in general. All right, let's go ahead and look at this code. I've re-implemented the isString type class right here so that we can write our own instances as opposed to using the one from base. So isString says, yeah, there's some type A, and I am able to convert from a list of chars into that A. And then I provide an instance for a list of chars. I have to turn on flexible instances again, and the implementation is trivial. It is ID. And then down here, I go ahead and I put strl in this. And if I run it, everything works fine. OK, no need for equality constraints yet. However, let's generalize this just a little bit. And instead of put sterling, we're going to call print. And we'll talk in a little bit about what the difference is between print and put sterling. Now we suddenly get an error message about an ambiguous type variable. We do not know which is string implementation we're trying to use. That seems a little surprising. Why? Let's talk about the difference between put sterlin and print. Put sterlin has a concrete input type of a list of chars. The input is always a list of chars, and therefore type inference is kicking in perfectly. We know, based off of the usage of put sterlin, or the compiler knows in fact, that we are trying to use the string implementation, the string instance of is string. Cool. Print is different. Print relies on the show type class. That is the constraint on the input to print. But it doesn't give us a concrete type. And now we have the intersection of two different non-concrete types. On the one hand, we have, we have a requirement from the from string method saying, hey, this thing has to be an implementation of is string. And from print, we have a constraint, hey, this thing has to be an implementation of show. And when you put those two things together, you now run into a complete ambiguous type, because lots of different types can fit that. String is one possibility, but text or byte string are two other possibilities. The compiler doesn't know what you mean to do, and therefore it gives up. And this is exactly the same story we had before of to char and from integer 
combining together to give the compiler some ambiguity about what it's trying to do. Equality constraints in general, the general purpose for them, you can avoid ambiguity in one of these two instances. When you have this intersection of two ambiguous instances, you can go ahead and lock one of them down so that type inference is able to determine the second instance. So let's see how this works. I'm going to, sorry, not over there. Let's pop back over here. And instead of saying is string for a list of chars, I'm going to say it's a, it is a list of Cs. Again, this will now cover every single possible instance of a list of somethings. But this implementation is false. If I try to run this, ambiguous type variable, eh, we'll get back to that in a second, ambiguous type variable. But even the implementation itself doesn't work because I haven't converted from my C into a char. So I've got to help the compiler out a little bit. And I have to say, yeah, by the way, when I said C, I really meant char. Now, hopefully you can guess what the next error message is going to be. Oops, got to turn on gadgets. Ambiguous type variable A from the use of the form string. Even here, we still end up with some kind of ambiguity because here, even the case of print, well, sure, we know if this is going to be a list, we know what's going on, but maybe it's not gonna be a list. Maybe it's going to be a concrete type string, a uh, text or byte string. So this doesn't even solve the problem completely. And if we really wanted this specific use case to work, we'd have to go even further. And we'd have to say something like, S is going to be a list of chars, and it's only going to have one specific instance. Problem with this is it's too limiting. We do want to have other instances, and therefore we have a, an inherent trade-off with these equality constraints between locking down the instances enough to get good type inference versus locking them down too much so that we completely destroy the polymorphism we're trying to get out of our type class instances. Okay, so when should you use it? You should use equality constraints if you need help with type inference. That's the general guiding principle of when to reach for this uh, technique. Again, there may be other uh, use cases that you'd, you'd consider, but this is the main one. And uh, you have to keep in mind, you don't mind restricting the number of instances you're allowed to write. In every case where you use an equality constraint, you are locking out other potential instances that you or someone else may want to write. So keep that in mind. All right, hope that was helpful. Have a good one. Talk to you later. Thank you.